Education of Good Love Project Limited and the Secretary of Bed for Health and Social Care. Yes, just a matter. Very pleased, my lords. I appear for the prospective appellant together with my learned friend, Mr. Yasser Vanderman, and the respondent is represented by Sir James EDQC, together with Ms. Sarah Wilkinson and Ms. Sarah Idelby. And my lords should have a bundle of documents, which includes some legislative material, and separately the case of Nolan and the USA. Yes, thank you. So the dispute, as my lords will have seen, is over the scope of Section 22B of the European Communities Act 1972 and how 22B applies to the facts of this case. Section 2 of the 1972 Act is found in the documents bundle at page 3.429. It's common ground that the virus for Reg 9, if there be a virus for it, is 22B, but I draw attention to the whole of 22, subject to Schedule 2, at any time after the passing of the Act, Her Majesty may, by order of Council, and any designated Minister or Department may, by order, rules, regulations, or scheme, make provision, A, for the purpose of implementing any EU obligation, etc., etc., B, for the purpose of dealing with matters arising out of or related to any such obligation or rights, etc., etc. Now, um, just by way of preamble, there is an arguable error in the approach of the respondent and the learned judge in that arguably their approach to the proper construction of 22B isn't fully accurate, and i just show two brief passages in relation to that. At uh, page 3.50, and this is the respondent's summary grounds of defence, at para 38.1, it said, management of shortages of prescription-only drugs is a matter arising Could out of... repeat the, the reference? I'm saying, sorry, it's 3.60. I think I may have said 50, I'm sorry. 3.60. 38.1. Management of shortages of prescription-only drugs is a matter arising out of and related to the EU obligations under the 2001 Directive to classify certain drugs as prescription only and to control their supply. The power to make SSPs and Regulation 9 was made for that purpose, etc., etc. The requisite connection to the EU legislative scheme is equally plain. So far, so good, insofar as this language reflects what, what you see in 22B. And then Mr Justice Supperstone at... 2.5, page 2.5, and this is paragraph 16, my lords. It is 22B of the 1972 Act that is relied on by the Secretary of State. The question is whether Regulation 9 <coughs> is, quote, for the purpose of dealing with matters arising out of or related to any such obligation. In my view, it plainly is. I agree with Sir James. Management of shortages of prescription-only drugs is a matter arising out of and related to the EU obligations under the 2001 Directive to classify certain drugs as prescription-only and to control their supply. Fine, as far as it goes, and it's true that on one view, 22B is expressed widely and permits the respondent to make any regulations... Uh, for the purpose of dealing with matters arising out of or related to EU rights and obligations. That's what, what it seems to say. But in my submission, though, it's arguable that Nolan and the USA shows that on its proper construction, 22B imposes a limit on the regulation-making power in that Regs under 22B will be lawful 
only if they are closely related to an EU right or obligation in the sense of tidying things up. And my essential submission is going to be that Reg 9 arguably goes beyond the rights and obligations in the directive and therefore is ultra virus 22b and unlawful. So if Reg 9 is considered desirable, it, it, it needs primary legislation. And that's the submission I'm going to, going, to, going to make, essentially. And so what I'm going to do, my lords, subject to my lords, is just um, spend a little bit more time introducing the issues and explaining why, in my submission, they're really important issues for various different reasons. Then look as speedily as I can at the directive, Reg 9, and then return to Nolan and make a few submissions about that in the way trailed. I'm, I'm sure you'll deal, deal, deal with this issue in, in the fullness of time, but uh, yes. in terms of, in fact, both of the passages to which you've referred us, both the submissions and the, the judgment, yes. uh, do, do you accept that uh, in, in terms of the obligations, the EU obligations that we're talking about under the directive, uh, that they uh, are uh, obligations to cl classify certain drugs as prescription only and to control their supply? Yes, I mean, control their supply is quite broad language, and the, the directive is specific, but that's a reasonable uh, umbrella yes. expression. Yes. Yes. Well, look, the first submission you identify in your scale of an argument uh, is that the directive imposes an obligation on member states to ensure that prescription only medicines are, are supplied only in the terms of a prescription. Yes, I'm, I'm absolutely not backtracking from, from that. Um, the. Um, how does that fit into the submissions? Well, the, the essential submission is that Reg 9 arguably will be ultra-virus if it goes significantly beyond the directive in terms of um, going beyond tidying things up. And there are a number of different ways in which one can express that illegitimate going beyond uh, the directive. One is that Reg 9 is actually inconsistent and incompatible with the directive, but there, is, there are fallback submissions after that, which is simply that Reg 9 does something different than what you see in the directive, and, it is, and it's pretty significant. Yes, I mean, in writing, you're led with the contention that uh, Regulation 9 is inconsistent and incompatible with the directive. I still will. I'm just trying to summarise briefly where I'm going. Can I just check? That doesn't seem to me to have been the way it was put in the judicial review ground to challenge, ground to claim. So it was raised the first time uh, in response to the uh, Secretary of State's summary grant of resistance, but uh, I think it, it was touched on below, to, to, so far as I can infer from the judgment of this Justice Officer. I just want to check that it's not a new point. No, I think my Lord is right. I think, uh, I stand to be correct, but I think what happened is that it was, frankly, only when we got the summary grounds of de defence that we fully appreciated the basis on which it was uh, said by the Secretary of State that Reg 9 was intravirus, and so the sort of Nolan was introduced by way of reply to the summary grounds of defence, and that was a significant issue then in the, the hearing before Mr Justice Supperstone. I mean, I wasn't there, I was elsewhere engaged, but I understand that that was the way, or one of the ways that uh, my learned friend Mr Drabble QC put it. Anyway, you're not departing now from the three main submissions in your written skeleton. No. It's just you're presenting them in the same written order. Yes, and I'm just trying to introduce them very, very briefly to give the general flavour. But I will absolutely unpack it in that way. Uh, um, so, so first of all, just by way of um, your further introduction, and I wanted, if I, if I may, just to explain why we say there are two reasons why this is a really important dispute. And the, the first is that Reg 9 impinges significantly on the way that prescription drugs are dispensed <coughs> and the doctor-patient relationship. So currently, reflecting long-standing practice in this jurisdiction, the law requires that potentially dangerous drugs, to use shorthand, uh, must be prescribed by an appropriately qualified 
medical professional with first-hand knowledge of the patient, and anyone authorised to supply uh, prescriptionary drugs must do so in accordance with the prescription. And now that's why, currently, if a pharmacist can't supply a patient with a, a prescription-only drug set out on a prescription, that's why, currently, the pharmacist has to either send the, the patient back to the, the medical professional, usually a GP or some other doctor, or the, that's why the pharmacist has to ring up uh, the, the, the medical professional who will then work out the best alternative treatment for, for that particular patient. That, 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 that's, gen, that's generally the case. Yes. G generally, prescription-only um, medicines, as the name suggests, uh, have to be supplied on the basis of a prescription. Uh, but there are, um, I, I think, about 25 exemptions in the 2012 regulations. N not all of them I, I, I accept uh, uh, cut out the prescriber, uh, but, but some do. Mm. Uh, you say that the ones that do are unlawful. Well, I'll come on to that. Um, but we <laughs> but well, I don't think you do say they're unlawful. You say in your written submissions that, that this case is to be distinguished from the others because uh, only in this case uh, do you se sever the link. Uh, yeah. You, that's what you say. <laughs> Let me just point very, very briefly now. That my Lord is absolutely right. That's what we do say. The respondent, uh, unless I'm missing something, hasn't relied on those other exemptions. They're not in the bundle, and we've not uh, advanced in writing any uh, specific submission about them. Their lawfulness is not, or otherwise, is not an issue in this particular case. Um, well, but my father, I've looked at them all. Yeah. Uh, because they are referred to in the written material. Uh, they're referred yeah. to, uh, and indeed uh, referred to in your skeleton argument, albeit they're not in the bundle. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the answer is that, um, by and large, they do not cut out the prescriber, as my Lord has indicated. Um, and mm -hmm. as far as most, concerns... Sorry, most, most of them don't. As far as concerns any, any other exemptions, as I say, the, the lawfulness... Uh, and the, the basis on which they may be lawful isn't an issue in these proceedings. They may be lawful under 22B. They may be lawful under Article 74, uh, sorry, under Article 71.4, the provision of the directive we'll, we'll, we'll look at in due course. But my submission is that this um, uh, regulation, as a matter of fact and degree, is uh, outside. Article 71.4, indeed, as far as I'm aware, it's not suggested it's within Article 71.4, and it does go beyond what's permitted by 22b. Um, you say that's a matter of fact and degree? Well, ultimately... Um, or a matter of construction? <laughs> no, no matter how far one pushes the issues of construction, ultimately there is a judgment that is going to have to be struck by, by the judiciary as to whether or not on the facts um, particular circumstances, particular regulations are out with um, Section 22B. And that's one of the uh, points that Lord Mance makes in, in the Nolan case. I mean, he goes for as far as he f feels he's able to go on providing guidance as to the proper construction of 22B and then makes it clear that ultimately that... Um, a properly construed 22B needs to be applied in a variety of factual circumstances. So, but, but, but your primary submission is uh, that, that it's not really a, a question of fact and degree in this case because the um, uh, regulation 226A, um, uh, it, it, the, the, the new regulation, is uh, directly contrary to the directive. Well, that's my primary submission. Absolutely, it certainly is. Uh, but that, so that, 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 in a sense, is not a matter of fact and degree because... It just comes head on uh, in collision with the directive, which you say requires a, a POM to be supplied on prescription. Full stop. No, I see my Lord's point in that, in, in that respect. It wouldn't be a matter of fact and degree. Some of your fallback positions, I, yes. I, 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 I see. I see yeah. the, the force of that. Um, yeah, so 
Coming back to the, the first reason why the issues are, are important, the significant way they impinge on the way prescription drugs are dispensed and the doctor-patient relationship, um, I think my, my lords already have the point that, that under Reg 9, the minister will allow pharmacists to dispense uh, to all patients um, different drug treatments than those set out on the patient's uh, prescription. Now, first of all, that change is of enormous importance to individuals who rely on prescription drugs. I'm not going to take my lords to the material but it's summarised in the judicial review grounds, as my lords will have seen, at 3.15 to 3.17. Um, the issue, though, is of great public importance, not just because of its potential impact on large numbers of vulnerable individuals who rely on prescription-only drugs, but because of the government's foot in the door and quite a large foot it is in terms of the state intervening in and indeed overriding and supplanting the doctor-patient relationship, albeit in the limited circumstances envisaged by, by Reg 9. So it's in those two different ways that the matter is of great importance to patients and, as my Lords will have seen, patients' representative groups. Well, we're concerned at this stage with the, the principle supply in accordance with the CMS shortage protocol. Yes. The, the detail is yet to be developed. As I understand it, what yes. is in the protocols, uh, what, what medicine, what patients <coughs> are covered, uh, that is for the next stage. That, that's so, but although, although the concerns, the two types of concerns I've just identified are maybe practical in nature in the, the way that they impinge on patients' lives, I hope I've articulated them in a, in a sort of principled way, but it's, it's, it's in principle that the risks that this process poses, and it's in principle the supplanting of the doctor-patient relationship, which is a matter of concern, uh, given that there hasn't been the usual parliamentary debate. And I'm going to come back to that just very, very briefly. After addressing the, the next reason uh, why the dispute over Reg 9 is important, and that's, for want of a better word, it's a constitutional reason, for want of a better word. In Section 22B of the Act, Parliament has authorised the Secretary of State to legislate, but only to a limited extent. In short, the Secretary of State is permitted to implement EU obligations, to give effect to EU rights, and to deal with certain closely related matters. And the... the Perhaps it's an obvious point, I don't want to labour it, but the important point is that any legislation that goes beyond those limits must be a matter for Parliament to consider in the usual way. And so, even in a case where it's EU law that suggests the need for additional domestic legislation, so even where the domestic legislation that's needed is very much in consequence of EU law, in principle, it's still for Parliament to decide uh, whether and how to legislate, o obviously unless the intended regulations do, do fall within 22B. And so that dividing line between what the Secretary of State's entitled to enact and what uh, it must be for Parliament to decide you know, is difficult to define with precision in the context of 22B, but it's, again, of great public importance. And this, is, this sort of constitutional issue, for want of a better word, is something that Lord Mance... Um, uh, uh, referred to in relation to the, the context of 2.2b and the need to construe it um, more narrowly than the language might, might first suggest. And this is paragraph 61 of his judgment in Milton. It's, uh, I have it down as 59, <laughs> 59 and 69. But yeah, yeah. So perhaps I can just briefly briefly turn, turn that up, just to see the way that uh, Lord Mans puts it. <clears throat> so at, at, at 59, Lord Mans has, has carefully considered this court's decision in Oakley, and he makes a number of points, 
uh, which he calls general observations. He makes the first one straight after 59. And then he says, second, as Lord Justice Waller and also Lord Justice May indicated in the Oakley case, words uh, such as those used in Section 2, 2 must be seen in the context of the primary purpose of Section 2, that being the bringing into force under Section 2 of the laws which under the treaties the UK has agreed to make part of its laws. Third, that is the context in which Parliament is prepared to delegate the lawmaking ability to the executive, and so on and so forth, to the end of that important passage in Parrot 59. <clears throat> and then, um, as my Lord says, he, 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 he uh, develops that over Paris 1661, and then at 69, um, at, towards the end of paragraph 69, he's explaining why, um, in his view, the regulations in Kukarova were ultra virus uh, 22b, and at, at just above capital B at 499, he returns to what I've perhaps inelegantly described as the, the, you know, the constitutional point. And the, the, the difficulty uh, with this particular point is the way that 22B is, is, is worded on the face of it. It's worded in a very, very broad way. But actually, when one looks at the context, it cannot have that, uh, or it does not have, arguably, on the base of Nolan, that uh, uh, broad scope. And the, the Lord Mance addresses that paradox in the language at Paris 62, where he says, you know, on, on, the, on the one hand, it, the, the language looks very wide. He says it authorises almost every conceivable provision required to fulfil fulfil the UK's obligations or give effect to EU rights. And then it's, he says it, but also it's it's confined. Now, <clears throat> between um, 59 uh, and 61, as says as has been put to me, Lord Mance uh, sets out his general observations about 22B. And his most detailed uh, guidance to the scope of 22B is at 61, where just below D, he, he uh, sorry, just above D, on page 496, he says, the further phrase related to any such obligational rights, must and must be done because something further the relationship required must exist objectively in the positioning of the phrase and its conjunction with the earlier wording of section 2 1 suggests to me, as they did to Lord Justice Waller and Lord <coughs> Justice May, that by speaking of the relationship, the legislature envisaged a close link to the relevant obligation or, or right. And then he goes on to give a, a fairly extreme example of, um, of regulations that would be out with the scope of 22B. Now, um, now the trouble with um, if respectfully, the trouble with the expression a, a close link to the relevant obligation or right is, well, where's, you know, where's the yardstick? What is a, how, how does one gauge whether there is a, a close link? What is, how close must it be? And here, uh, this is the second time, at least the second time, that Lord Mans has referred with apparent approval to what Lord Justice Warren and what Lord Justice May said in the Oakley case. And I just wanted to turn back to that. That's in para 56. Lord Justice Waller at um, capital E on the side talks about further measures which naturally arise from or closely relate to the primary purpose. And then at G, uh, Lord Justice May talks about regulations which, uh, regulation which has the effect of tidying things up or making closely related original choices which the directive doesn't necessarily require. So, um, you know, with the proviso that um, paraphrase is both needed and at the same time is potentially treacherous and misleading, um, I draw attention in particular to Lord Justice May's homely phrase, tidying things up as a um, illuminating 
and practical um, uh, uh, yardstick uh, for the kind of regulation that is intra virus uh, too, too big. Now, leaving aside the, the first way we, we, we put it, the, the, that Reg 9 is, is frankly inconsistent with the directive, ultimately there is going to be an a evaluative question for the court whether or not this, whether Reg 9 has a sufficiently close link to the relevant EU right or obligation, and if my Lord's accept that, at least for today's purposes, where we're at arguability, Lord Justice May's phrase, tidying things up, is, is useful. You know, there's going to be an evaluative question there, and that's a matter for the court. But I do come back to the very first reason why the case is really important, namely the potential adverse effect on patients. Uh, it, so as, as the court will have seen, Reg 9 has caused uh, considerable concern amongst patients and patient representative groups, and one could call it a furore. Um, one can say that Reg 9 is, is seen, uh, and in my submission understandably so, as impinging pretty significantly on patients and on the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, ultimately, it's a matter of court, of course, but you know, these are not people who have any complaint with the directive. Um, and their concerns are pointers that Reg 9 does go beyond uh, mere tidying up. I mean, to, 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 to be fair, uh, Lord Justice May doesn't restrict himself to tidying up. He goes on to say, but which has the effect of tidying things up or making closely related original choices, which the directive does not necessarily require. Um, I mean, yes. the, 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 uh, the, the, the thrust of the point you make is... Uh, I understand that in any event. Yes. Uh, but he doesn't restrict himself to tidying up. Um, no, no, uh, that, that, that's, that's very fair. But then, how, again, how does one, <coughs> what is the yardstick for a closely related original uh, choice that the director doesn't necessarily require, bearing in mind that, bearing in mind the function of 22B and the availability of Parliament for anything that goes significantly beyond the directive that might require some kind of policy decision to be made about w what is the right thing to have in domestic law, consequential upon EU legislation. So the overall, uh, perhaps it's more maybe a submission than simply something that comes from Lord Justice May, but in, in my submission, uh, anything that goes beyond simple tidying up is open to serious question. So, um, so there are, with that perhaps rather long introduction, I mean, there, there are obviously three things to consider, what the directive provides, what Reg 9 provides, and whether Reg 9 is intra virus 22B in the way it's already flagged up. So the uh, directive, my lords, is behind um, tab 6 in the, in the documents bundle, and it's from page 3.436. <clears throat> it may be uh, convenient to start with Article 6, which is at page 3.443, which provides that no medicinal product may be placed on the market of a member state unless a marketing authorization has been issued by the competent authorities of that member state in accordance with this directive, all authorizations being granted in accordance with another regulation. Um, as I think my lords will know, the competent authority in the UK is the Medicines and Health Products Regulatory Agency. Other countries have competent authorities, and the EU has a centralised competent authority. The only important point here is that neither the Secretary of State nor any of its ministers, or any ministers, are a competent authority for these purposes. So turning to three point. Page 3.57, one gets to Article 70, and as I'm sure my Lords would have seen, in Article 70.1, when a marketing authorisation is granted, 
the competent authorities shall specify the classification of the medicinal product into a medicinal product subject to medical prescription and a medicinal product not subject to medical uh, prescription. And then... I, I, I think there's, I think there's a, a small hiccup in the direction. I, I, I don't say that this matters at all. Ah. Um, in, in, the, in the definitions um, uh, uh, article, which is Article One. One, uh, 19, um, yes, what, what is defined is a, a, a medicinal prescription. What the text of the um, uh, directive refers to are medical prescriptions. I mean, I, 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 I admit, <laughs> um, you may say it's an, it's, a, it's, it's an obvious mistake, and it clearly means that, uh, it clearly refers to the same thing. I'm, I'm sure that's right. Well, we're going to have to put our heads together on that, possibly if the case proceeds further, but can we? Can we proceed on the basis that arguably it's an obvious mistake it, no, no. for today's purposes? Course, yes. it's, just yeah. a, it's just an, an oddity, I think. Yeah. Um, I think there is a case which deals with that, which might... I'd, I'd, I'd be surprised about, if there wasn't a case which dealt with obvious mistakes in directives. No, 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 it wasn't. It was a case about medicinal products. But, oh, right, right. Um, right, so, um, so, so 72 makes some additional uh, provisions. And then... Um, Article 71 um, provides that medicinal products shall be subject to med medical <coughs> prescription in certain circumstances. Um, and I suppose one could broadly describe those circumstances as the, the circumstances where the, the, the medicinal product in question poses some kind of risk to, to patients in various circumstances. And then... Um, Two and three allow for subcategories. I'm going to come back to 71.4, if I may. And then 72 to, to, to 75 comprise the, the rest of the regime. So it's subject to 71.4, which I'm going to come to shortly. The scheme for classifying drugs as uh, prescription only or not prescription only is detailed and, and mandatory. Obviously, a judgment has got to be exercised by the competent authority whether a medicinal product should be classified as prescription only. Um, but once that judgment has been made, the product must be classified as prescription only. And arguably, in my submission, this means that it can only be prescribed by an appropriately qualified professional person, <coughs> i.e. not a government minister. And the reason why I say it means that primarily, uh, frankly, turns on Article 1.19, which my Lord has already drawn uh, uh, attention to, where a medicinal uh, prescription, and I would say arguably a medicinal product, is defined as a, 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 any medical prescription issued by a professional person qualified um, to do so. And if one uh, looks at some of the recitals, they emphasize the important principle that prescription only products can only be prescribed by appropriate qualified professionals. So the, re the relevant recitals are 47. And then 50 to, to 52, and if I may, I'll just leave my lords to, to read those passages through. Sorry, 47 and... And then 50 to 52 of the recitals. So simply outline the importance of the position and status of appropriately qualified medical professionals when it comes to prescription-only drugs. And these relate to the advertising restrictions. Exactly. That's what they relate to. So, so in my submission, it is arguable, and some would say very plain, that the directive defines a prescription-only medicinal product as a medicinal product that um, 
must only be supplied pursuant to a prescription issued by an appropriately qualified medical uh, professional. Now, I don't really know how much time I need to spend on 71.4, because it, my learned friend hasn't taken a point on 71.4 or suggested that um, Reg 9 um, is, is justified well, by... It shows that the, there is a discretion in member states in relation to classification. Yes. And it may be said, well, if there's a discretion in relation to classification, uh, would it not be surprising if there is no discretion in relation to the flow of supply? Well, first of all, I'll see, I do have to address Article 71 for them. But I mean, first of all, the waiver power in 71.4 is a power to be exercised by the competent authority and only the competent authority, uh, which the government minister is, is not. Um, and then, um, I, I suppose, in answering my Lord's question, I would draw attention to the. Um, circumscribed nature of 71.4. It only goes so far. Um, so the relevant considerations in 71.4, which are set out there in, in A and B, don't include the fact that there is a, a shortage of another different prescription drug. That's not what they're driving at. On the contrary, the uh, exceptions all relate to the types of ways in which a particular drug that falls within Article 71 might be used in practice. So, for example, I'm afraid this is based on my own Googling and very poor knowledge of medicinal products, as I understand it, hydrocortisone, for example, is a, is a prescriptionary drug. But as we all know, probably, it's often found packaged up in various skin products um, that are not classified as prescription-only because of the... Uh, low level of course, hydrocortisone in the cream and the, the manner of use. So it's that sort of thing, uh, 71.4. Paracetamol, I think, is another example. If it's in packages of 32, you can get it from a pharmacy, otherwise it's prescription only. So it's that sort of thing. So 71.4 allows a competent authority not to classify a medicinal product as prescription only in limited circumstances. But that's not what an SS does. It's not issued by a competent authority. It keeps in place the classification of products as prescription only. It just allows them to be supplied otherwise and in accordance with a prescription. And um, So in my submission, it's doing something very different. Leaving aside 71.4, or even taking into account 71.4 if one wants to, the EU regime is straightforward and unequivocal. There are certain medicinal products that um, must be classified as prescription only, and that means they can only be issued to a patient pursuant to a um, prescription issued by a medically qualified and appropriately qualified professional person. So... If that's right, you, you, you say that um, even if that would re result in um, severe difficulties for the patient and, and possibly um, a, a part of the National Health Service, or, 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 sorry, a part of the health service, wherever it is, coming to a complete halt, that's still the case. Because, I mean, I know you're coming on to this, but I mean, for example, in a pandemic, that's one of the uh, one of the exemptions, um, uh, w one can imagine that uh, in a pandemic, uh, the requirement for um, a, a prescription may be very, very difficult because of the burden on the on the the prescribers. Yeah. Can I can I answer that in sort of stages? First of all, can I, mean, I will look at the pandemic example, but but first of all, can I bring? Uh, the, the, the facts back to the facts of, of sorry, the facts of this case, just to keep one's feet on the ground, as the government's own uh, material indicates, what happens now and what has happened for a considerable period of time is that if, or when I should say, there is a shortage of a particular prescription-only drug, mm. 
Um, all that happens is that the pharmacist either phones up the, <coughs> let's just call the appropriately qualified medical practitioner a doctor from now on, if I may. The pharmacist phones up the doctor and says, well, what do you want me to do with this particular patient? Or the patient goes back to the doctor and the doctor makes a patient-centered um, decision. But so, the doctor give, so the doctor gives the patient another prescription. The, the patient goes along to the pharmacy. That's not available either. Because guess what? There's a severe shortage of drugs in a particular group. Well, if, let me take that in stages. Um, if, if the pharmacist phones up the doctor on the first scenario, <laughs> no doubt there'll be some kind of discussion about what's available. Um, suppose the pharmacist doesn't phone up the doctor. In practice, it may be that the doctor prescribes completely blind in the way that my Lord has indicated might be the case. But um, it, it's obviously open to the Secretary of State in a case of severe shortages of whole groups of medicines, if one wants to think about that nightmare scenario, which one does have to think about, of course. It's obviously open to the Secretary of State to promulgate guidance to GPs to let them know what medicines are in severe shortage and should only be prescribed in, in really compelling cases, what medicines are sort of totally unavailable, and what the alternatives are. And then the GP can you know, use his or her, the doctor can use his or her professional skill to prescribe the most appropriate alternative <coughs> amongst what's available or, or to make no or, to, or not to prescribe at all because it's considered too 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 fraught so so those are the ways in which matters are dealt with now in the particular context that we're dealing with there are absolutely no reason the heavens will not fall if that continues they will simply remain in situ it's uh, not just perfectly pragmatic but it preserves the everything that flows from the important doctor-patient relationship. Yeah. So that's the sort of practical answer. As, as far as concerns the pandemic situation from, from, from memory, the exemption is that where there is a... Uh, I'll say thank you. But there's still... I think my memory is quite good. It's that where there is a pandemic um, and a... Uh, or the, where there is or there may imminently be a pandemic. And is this regulation 247? This is 226. Two, well, there are two. One is 226 okay. and the other is 247. Yeah, 247. Oh, well, 247 the, deals with protocols. Um, but I'll look at 247 in a little while. Maybe it, just look at two, 226 for the moment since that's what I have. That's where there is or imminently will be a pandemic with a serious risk to human health. And there is a, uh, and there is a prescription. Well, it's not. It's that if he satisfied that on a previous occasion there was a prescription. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, that's what I meant. There, on a previous occasion there was a prescription. Well, but that's not the same no. as no, 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 it's supply not the same. pursuant to a, uh, to a prescription. Right. Well, so even even that example uh, is one where on your on the construction of. Article 7071 that you put forward, it's difficult to see how it fits. Uh, well, yes, that's right. Um, so, you know, either, either uh, 226 is ultra virus, but no one has taken the point, and it's probably now far too late to do so, so it's there in, in the law, and nobody minds about that, whereas they do mind about Meg 9. So, either that, or it's perfectly intravirus um, in the sense that it is, um, um, albeit incompatible on the face of it with the directive, such a small and justifiable change that it is either intravirus or uh, that it's intravirus a directive or something that's authorised under 22B. I mean, the lawfulness of 226 isn't an issue, but there, there, either it's unlawful or it's, it's lawful for justifiable reasons. The focus, in my respectful submission, has to remain on, on, um, on Reg 9. One can't say, well, um, 
well, in my respectful submission, arguably one can't say, well, you know, we think Reg 226 is, is lawful and therefore Reg 9 must be. That's uh, perhaps a way of, uh, in which the respondent could sort of pull himself up by his bootstrings. But in my respectful submission, it's not a legitimate way. The focus is on the lawfulness of, of Reg 9 in the light of um, uh, 2 b Whether other regulations are get within 71.4 or 2 b or are unlawful is neither here nor there. Well, that, that, I mean, that's right so far as it goes. But we, we, do, have, we do have to think, um, as you're um, putting forward a, a, a principle based on the directive, uh, that is that prescription-only drugs have to be supplied only, uh, can only be supplied mm. uh, uh, on, on a prescription. We, we have to think through the consequences, the consequences of, of in practice. As, a, as a principle and, yeah. and, and, and um, uh, whether those consequences could possibly have been intended. We have to consider that. Yes. Because that's a tenet of construction. Well, I think, uh, if I may, I'm going to leave my submission where it, where it stands, um, and I may uh, come back to my lords on the compatibility point in the, in the very hard-edged way you know, that I have been putting it and that I still maintain. Um, so I'm going to come back to that. Um, uh, And when I come to my submissions, I will return to that point, whilst also sort of focusing on, on the, the, the fallback submissions, whether or not um, Reg 9 is frankly incompatible with the directive. Is it, is it the, the kind of extension, for want of a better word, that is... Um, modest enough to fall within the two b which is another another matter. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, just turning to to Reg Nine, um, I have that at page three point two eight one. And so the reference it inserts is my lord to see the, a new regulation 226 capital A, and the reference is straight away to reg 241 of the existing 2012, sorry, 214 of the existing 2012 regs. I'm sure my lords have that, but that's at page 3.431. That's the, the reg that says a person may not sell or supply a prescription only medicine except in accordance with the prescription given by an appropriate um, practitioner. Subject to the Chapter 3 exemptions. Subject to the Chapter 3 um, exemptions. Um, two, two, the new 226A disapplies 214 where conditions A, B, and C are, are met. So, just three points about the way that Reg 9 works. Uh, first, it's issued by ministers and not the competent authority. Secondly, the threshold is, is low. A rational opinion, and this is 5A, a rational opinion that uh, the UK is experiencing or may experience a serious shortage of one or more prescription-only drugs. The concept of serious shortage isn't... Um, defined in this regulation, and in particular it's not clear how questions of cost may be factored in. And then finally at 5b, it provides for prescription only medicinal products to be provided to a patient otherwise than pursuant to prescription issued by a professional person qualified to do that. So in that sense, in my submission, it's arguable that it does allow for the clinical judgment of a medical professional to be both overridden and indeed then bypassed. 
you know, th there are obviously a number of safeguards built into the scheme here in Reg 9, and this has been pointed out by my Lord, um, there may be additional safeguards built into the serious shortage protocol scheme when, when one sees its final shape. But when all is said and done, um, whereas in my submission, Articles 119 and 71 require prescription-only products to be supplied only pursuant to a doctor's prescription. Um, Reg 9 provides for prescription-only drugs to be supplied pursuant to a document issued by the government. Now, it, it's, it's not necessary for me to go that far and to demonstrate arguable incompatibility between Reg 9 and um, Article 71. All I have to show is that Reg 9 does something different than what the directive does, that it, that it adds to it or extends it in a way that goes beyond um, simple tidying up something that will uh, almost inevitably be uh, no more controversial than the underlying directive. And that, that brings me back to 22B and, and Nolan. I think my Lords will have seen that the Nolan had an incredibly convoluted history uh, so that the 22B issue arose in, in a sort of quite strange way in Nolan, and I wasn't proposing to take up time going through that. I'll take that as, as read. Um, and I just wanted to, to look a little bit at the facts of Cookerover and Nolan, and Cookerova being one of the cases that Lord, Lord Mance looks at in, in, in Nolan, to um, see if my submissions can gain a better degree of traction in terms of what is the kind of thing that falls within 22B. And um, Cookerova is the one at um, <coughs> Para 67. I was really going to be assisted by the factual instances of what does or does not fall in 22B. But on the same principle, I try to understand you rely on the Lord Manson's judgment. But do the facts of other cases really regard to matters? I thought that they did, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm getting the impression it. that they won't. So what I'll, <laughs> what I'll do is um, just really very, very shortly summarise what went on in Kukareva and, and Nolan. You, 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 in both cases, you had directives that applied a particular scheme to limited numbers of bodies, quite carefully delineated numbers of bodies. And in both cases, you then had domestic regulations that took exactly that scheme in the directive but extended it to additional bodies that the directive didn't apply to. And that happened in two different ways to two different sorts of, of bodies. And in both of those cases, um, again, for, for perhaps slightly different reasons that it's not necessary to go into, Lord Mance held that um, the domestic regulations went were outside 22B. Um, in, in the case of Nolan, as my lords will have seen, actually the, the, the directive wouldn't have had the competence to embrace the additional, um, to, to impose itself on the additional categories of people that the domestic regulation did. But Lord Mansfield, well, even if the EU did have the competence to go that far, the extension to those additional people would still be something that was outside 22B. So in, in both those cases, one has domestic regulations extending a regime, not changing the regime, simply extending it to different groups of people. Um, in this case, in, in my submission, is a fortiori because... Um, Reg 9 isn't simply extending what's 
in the directive, so it applies to a wider group of people, it is changing or adding to or extending, if one wants to put it in that way, what's in the regime in a significant way. Now, I, I would submit that arguably one can't even describe Reg 9 as an extension because it's not actually um, amplifying something that one sees in the directive. The directive simply does not um, embark at all on what steps member states might uh, have to take or might want to take in the event of um, a serious a shortage of uh, prescription-only products. So in my submission, one can't even really describe Reg 9 as an extension. But even if, I mean, I don't want to get involved in the arid semantic dispute here, even if it was felt that an extension, broadly speaking, could be an appropriate word to use, the question still comes back to whether it's an extension that's... Uh, significant in the very modest sense that it um, goes beyond mere tidying up, it doesn't have a sufficiently close link to a particular right or, or obligation. And there's uh, four ways in, in my respectful submission in which um, arguably Reg 9 goes beyond what 2GB permits and I've already trailed these, but I'll just summarise them here for, for convenience before moving on to the domestic issue. First of all, in my submission, Reg 9 is inconsistent with Article 119 and Article 71. Secondly, Reg 9 introduces something additional and new, directive doesn't deal with drug shortages. The directive doesn't deal with overriding prescriptions or bypassing clinical judgments. just doesn't deal with it. So even if, for whatever reason, Reg 9 wasn't inconsistent with Article 119 and Article 71, it's still a significant departure from what one actually finds spelled out in the, in the, in the directive. Um, but but if, it, if it's, I understand the inconsistency point, that's a, that's a very stark and clear point. Yes. But if Regulation 9 is, is not inconsistent with the directive, um, that means that the directive uh, allows um, uh, nationally for um, POMs to be supplied without a prescription. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and so the, nationally there has to be a, a, a scheme for dealing with the supply of these, as you say, d dangerous uh, um, uh, POMs without a prescription. Well, there, there could be. There can be. Am I being too pernickety? No, no, d no. Does there have to be? But, but, but. No, no, I'm, I'm just trying to, 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 to work out... Um, uh, 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 over and above the inconsistency point, if, the, if there is no inconsistency, um, why section 223 still doesn't cover this? 22B doesn't cover this. Well, if there's no inconsistency, then uh, as, as it was put in the passages from the learned judge's judgment and my learned friend's skeleton argument that I drew attention to at the beginning, if there's no inconsistency, then on the face of 22B, read literally, one might say, or read, read broadly, there is no problem at all. No, it relates, it, it, it relates to this. It relates, broadly speaking, it's about drugs. It relates to the uh, so, so supply and control like of prescription-only drugs. What more do you want to see? You know, so, so if one leads to to be like that, absolutely plain sailing. But the, in, in my respect for submission, the arguable error in the approach of the respondent and the learned judge is that um, their uh, um, uh, approach to 2TB isn't complete because if one 
focuses on Nolan, that language, which at first blush seems to be so wide and allows in sort of anything to do with prescription only drugs that um, a domestic authority, the domestic legislature thinks is reasonable, is actually far, far more, more limited. And that's the constitutional point that, that Lord Mant refers to at, at least twice. But absolutely, one can have EU legislation which a national legislature looks at and, and says, well, we, you know, it doesn't deal with this, it doesn't deal with that, it doesn't deal with that. There are a lot of consequential provisions we think we need to have in place. Absolutely fine. The question is, who decides? Is it going to be the sector state under 22B or, or Parliament? Where do you draw that, that line? And if my submission is that it's arguable that the line is, is crossed where, and I'm going to try to sort of just put this in a number of different ways to convey my basic submission. The line is crossed if um, the domestic regulations go beyond mere tidying up, if they involve some kind of policy uh, departure, if they involve some new element, if they deal with something that you, know, you don't find in the directive, um, if so for legitimate reasons, they're controversial. These are all markers which indicate that the bounds of Q2B have been overstepped in a particular, in a particular case. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so one, one, one factor, although it's not um, uh, determinative, is, is, is I mean, Lord Mantis addresses a lot of factors, but my attention has just been drawn to Paragraph 66. One of the factors here is whether um, the domestic provisions extend a regime domestically into areas not covered by or specifically excluded from the EU, re EU regime, that may well fall outside of uh, both Paris 22B. But again, ultimately, as I accepted earlier, on the basis of proper construction of 22B, there is simply leaving aside the incompatibility point as uh, a judgment to be, to be struck. But ultimately, it comes back to questions of, is there, is there something new? Uh, is there something controversial? Is there something that involves a policy decision? Is there a departure? Is there a tension? Is it, is it significant? Is it beyond mere tidying up? So that's, um, and arguably in my expert submission it is, and the issue is hugely important in terms of how far the Secretary of State is able to go under 22B, and it doesn't look like well, it has that many cases under 22B to look at. Um, and, it, of course, it's very important in terms of vulnerable patients and the doctor-patient relationship. I wanted next, if I may, to turn to um, the domestic law, which is the Appeal Ground 3, and Section 64 of the uh, Medicines Act, which is behind tab, tab 6, and it's um, page 3.419. I think we tried to set out uh, in, in the skeleton argument what 64.1 says when you read it together with section 64b. So it's, no person shall to the prejudice of the purchaser sell any medicinal product which isn't of the nature or quality demanded by the purchaser. And then a little five that language has to be changed where the medicinal product is sold or supplied in pursuance of prescription, essentially, broadly, um, where a medicinal product is sold or supplied in pursuance of prescription, it must be in accordance with the prescription or there'll be a criminal offence. And the short point is whether sale or supply in a protocol case is sale or supply in pursuance of the prescription. Exactly. Um, and the, the, the Exactly. The argument accepted by the learned judge is that uh, Section 64 is inapplicable 
um, where the supply of a medicinal product is not in pursuance of a prescription, but is in pursuance of a, of a protocol. Um, now, in my submission, it is arguable, and some would say very strongly arguable, that that drives a coach and horses through the patient protection um, offered by Section 64, flat contrary to the whole purpose of Section 64. What is the purpose of Section 64? Arguably, and some would say very plainly, the purpose is to ensure that when a person attends a pharmacy with a prescription or some other place where medicinal products are supplied, the supplier of medicinal products supplies exactly what's on the prescription and nothing else on pain of a criminal sanction. That's the purpose of Section 64. And all, all that's meant by in pursuance of a prescription having regard to the purpose of Section 64 is that there has to be a prescription and the prescription has to be the, the cause and occasion of the supply of the medicinal product. It's nothing fancier than that. Once the patient presents the prescription and a medicinal product supplied on that occasion, Section 64 is engaged. So the purpose and meaning of Section 64, arguably, is to prohibit any overriding, and I do emphasize any, any overriding of the medical professional's judgment as to what medicinal product is to be supplied, whether that overriding comes from an individual pharmacist, all of the pharmacists together, <coughs> or a minister. So just, just to illustrate that, suppose the, Royal, suppose the Royal Pharmaceutical Society published a protocol of their own that required pharmacists to supply drug A whenever a patient attended with a prescription for drug B. In my submission, that would be arguably, and some would say obviously, unlawful in breach of Section 64, and it, it simply wouldn't be open to a pharmacist in subsequent criminal proceedings to say, well, I wasn't supplying drug A pursuant to the prescription, I was supplying it pursuant to the Royal, Royal Pharmaceutical Society's protocol. And the position is exactly the same in principle if the minister published the protocol uh, allowing pharmacists to supply patients with drug A when they turn up uh, with a prescription for drug uh, B. Um, the whole basis on which uh, medicines have been prescribed, and there may be very, very exceptional circumstances, which may or may not be lawful, and they're not an issue, but the fundamental basis on which medicines have been prescribed for many, many years in this jurisdiction is that there's a clinical judgment by a medical professional who has a doctor-patient relationship with a particular patient, and no one else, not the pharmacist, not a member of the government, not a member of the executive, no one is entitled to superimpose their views and over on and override that professional judgment. And that, that's the protection afforded by Section 64, which is absolutely turned on its head if anyone supplying a drug can simply say, well, I know he turned up with a prescription and we gave him drugs on, on that occasion, but actually we, we weren't looking at the prescription, we were looking at something else. And that's what we were, that's what guided us. That, in my respect, this mission is flat contrary to Section 64, construing it sensibly in accordance with its, with its purpose. Of course, that position can be overridden by uh, legislation, but uh, in my respectful submission, arguably, that legislation must come, if it comes at all, from Parliament after the usual procedures. And as I indicated uh, earlier in, in response to questions from the bench, the heavens aren't going to fall while Parliament considers whether this uh, serious shortage protocol, something new in this jurisdiction, is actually the right way to go, and if so, how should it be, how should it be implemented? The heavens aren't going to fall. They're going to remain completely where they are. If there's a shortage, a pharmacist will contact, will phone the doctor, will send the person back to the doctor. Uh, the government can issue guidance about what to do when there, when there are shortages. Um, and then 
the doctor can do what the doctor uh, does and what doctors in this jurisdiction have done for many years, which is to decide, having regard to the particular patient in front of them, should they follow the government advice about alternatives, should they do something different, or should they just not prescribe anything at all for the time being. That's all that will happen if we are, if we, if we are right in, in practical terms. Um, so, if I may just check, I've not missed anything. Oh, I may have done. unless I can assist further. Um. Thank you very much for showing this tonight. Thank you. I, I, I think, Sir James, before you begin, I, I think we, certainly I would like to take stock. So I think we'll rise for a few moments and then uh, come back. Thank you very much. Okay.